This video doesn't have any cool high-speed footage of towers breaking or new record scores, but it might be one of the most important videos I've created to help teams take the next steps to being highly competitive. As you can tell from the title, it's all about taking notes of your builds. I'll talk a bit about why we need to take notes at all, explain how I take notes so you can decipher my builds better, and then I'll spend a little time discussing how to collect and summarize notes for an entire team. The why part of good note taking is pretty obvious, and it's not because the rules say you need to submit a log. If you don't know yet, this event is all about building devices that very often fail during testing. If you've built the perfect tower during practice, it doesn't do you any good unless you know exactly how to reproduce it. Most of our builds are not perfect, so the other primary reason to take detailed notes is to be able to experiment with changes for our next build without changing too many factors at once. A big key to success in this event is to build a lot of devices, but they can't just be random builds. Random building can help with your construction skills, but it won't help you find that perfect optimization for the first place finish. The iterative cycle you're looking for is to build a device, test it to failure, carefully observe what happened, and then build a new device taking that information into account. With good record keeping and consistent build techniques, that process can achieve great things. Now I want to explain in more detail how I document these tower builds. Remember, there is no right and wrong way, but it's important that you capture enough information that you could exactly reproduce the build. Before we look at the notebook pages, I wanted to mention that I also document every single build with pictures. I try and take several construction pictures as well as the finished build and one right before testing on the scale. That way there is no confusion documenting that critical piece of information. Now let's take a closer look at the notes associated with my Division C benchmark build. I created an entire video showing the results of this tower you might want to watch if you haven't already, but this will be about explaining my notes. Because I already have the 3D assembly jig, which defines the height and angles of the tower, the entire design can be captured by a single 2D side drawing like this. Here we have 10 cross-member layers shown by the 10 blue X's in the middle. We know the total length of the legs is 61.5 centimeters, and the bottom layer starts at 0.5 centimeters. That means we have exactly 6.1 centimeters between the layers, shown here in green on the left side. I have marked the actual measurements for each layer in blue on the left. These values are then used to mark each leg with a small dot to know where to glue the cross members. The green numbers on the right represent the length of each individual cross member and how many there are. For example, the bottom layer is 16 centimeters long and we'll need eight of them to complete all four sides of the tower. I add up all the lengths and multiply by eight to get the total length. Here that means this tower design will use 928.8 centimeters of crossmember material. My 36 inch sheets of balsa are actually a bit longer than that and tend to be about 93 centimeters each. That means I'll need roughly 10 sticks of material for this build. You'll actually need more material than that because there is waste, but knowing that it will require about 10 sticks of material is a great way to estimate the final weight before gluing anything. There is a lot of information packed into this notebook section, so I'll go over each piece one at a time. First is the title. I like to number my build sequentially and reference which design it is. Here you can see that it was my second build using the Division C rules with no bonus. For the legs, you can see that I document that they were 1 8 by 1 8, and in black ink I have the masses recorded at 65 centimeters, and in red I have the masses recorded at 61.5 centimeters. That just means when I started building these towers, I originally cut all the potential legs longer than necessary at a standardized length of 65 centimeters. Later, I started cutting the raw material directly to 61.5 centimeters. So in some of my notes, you won't see the 65 centimeter mass. You can see more clearly what I'm talking about in this picture showing my material library for the legs. I also like to weigh all four legs together on the scale to get the most accurate measurement. If you just add up the masses of the legs listed here, it comes to 2.90 grams, but the accurate measurement is 2.885 grams. Unless you have a milligram accurate scale, this step might not be very useful, but it's always good to double check and it can be useful in calculating accurate glue usage later. Now let's talk about the cross member layers. First, I just document that I'm using 10 layers and have copied over the green dimensions from the previous design page. For this build, I used different cross-member sizes and densities for three different layer groups. 
For the first two layers, I used 1 16th by 1 16th material, and the density per complete stick was around 0.27 grams. A complete stick means a strip cut to the proper dimensions from the entire 36 inch sheet of balsa. It's next to impossible to label these tiny sticks, so my technique is to just weigh them and put them into general mass groups. Here a single stick weighs 0.201 grams. The same way I like to build a library of legs to choose from, I like to build a library of different density groups for the various sizes I'm using in the cross members as well. With that in mind, now you can see how I document that in this build. Layers 3, 4, and 5 were made from 1 20th by 1 20th and came from the mass bin of 0.16 to 0.17 grams. Similarly, layers 6 through 10 still used 1 20th by 1 20th, but came from a lighter group of 0.14 to 0.15 grams per stick. Once I have picked the raw material to use for each of these layer groups, the next step is to pre-cut all the pieces for every layer. Here is a picture of all the cross members layers pre-cut. As I've mentioned in other videos, I actually like to cut these pieces into two times their length and just mark the middle. This helps to keep the number of pieces more manageable. Each layer here is four double length pieces. So for example, instead of eight pieces at 16 centimeters, I have four pieces at 32 centimeters. I will cut the piece in half right before gluing it in place. Next, I take the actual measurement of those groups and record the combined mass for each layer. These are the red numbers on the right side of the page. It's always a good sanity check to make sure that every layer going up is lighter than the previous one because they are shorter and because of the density changes. If a layer looks off, try cutting a new batch. Sometimes the variation in the balsa sheets, even along a single tiny strip, can cause that to happen. Finally, I just add all the masses of the layers together to get the total mass of all the cross member material. Here that was 1.794 grams. I like to record the mass of the tower right after it's complete. This mass can vary depending on the relative humidity at the time. Here the tower weighed 5.27 grams. The dry value recorded here is the mass after the tower has been in the sealed dry box for at least 24 hours. You can watch my competition prep video to see why this step is very important. This mass is very controlled and independent of current ambient conditions and is a good representation of the realistic competition weight. Here the tower lost just over 3% of its mass due to the humidity in the air, which is a fairly typical result. Always try and record video of your device being tested. The goal is to see if you can tell what failed first or if anything else bad happened during the testing. Most people don't have access to a fancy high speed camera, but modern phones can do a pretty good job. Set them at their highest frame rate and test your device in as much light as possible. Frame the recording as tight as you can with just the tower and frame to get as many pixels as possible on the thing you care about. Don't bother filming the bucket or other aspects of the test. If you have multiple phones, try and set them up to all record from different angles. Take notes from analyzing the video and record them in your log. I don't show that here, but at minimum record the mass held, the actual efficiency, and the competition score. I wanted to show a couple quick examples of design tweaks I looked at that didn't pan out. Even though these builds didn't give great results, you can see that I documented the attempts in detail just in case. In this event, you can often learn as much from your failures as from your successes. Here is a design I tried that only used eight layers and included a one centimeter gap between the cross member joints. I actually built two towers with this design, but neither of them look promising compared to my best benchmark design. Feel free to freeze on this page if you want to study these builds in more detail. The next design iteration was even more radical. I attempted to use engineered L-shaped legs to increase the buckling strength to see if I could get down to just five cross bracing layers. Here you can see I combined the design sketch with the build part. The final result turned out heavier than I wanted and the results were poor, so I knew this approach wouldn't be nearly good enough to compete with the conventional design. The final thing I wanted to talk about in this video is how to apply these note taking techniques across multiple team members or an entire team if you are a coach. Everything I've shown so far has just been my notes and my personal logbook. That's great, and I know I'm recording enough to get a lot of benefit from it, but what if you're working with multiple people and they all have different ideas about what to log? I'm gonna show the solution I used when I coached Boomilever several years ago. To really leverage the information from everyone's build, 
it's very important that everyone is recording the exact same thing. I found a very useful tool for that is to create a form with important pieces of information to fill out. Students would still have their own personal notebooks to record anything they wanted in addition to this, but we made sure to record these key pieces of information for every build. Here is a page from one of my filled out forms covering about 10 different builds. You can see that sometimes not everything got filled out and there are some extra things packed in there, but in general I followed the rules for these builds. The final step for recording the data for the entire team was to enter the data for every team member's forms into a master spreadsheet. This is where we could really benefit from seeing what worked and what didn't using everyone's builds. You can even see notes on the right side about pretest loading, failure modes, and competition results. If you are coaching an entire team of builders, I highly recommend some kind of tracking like this as it can really help to keep things organized. I hope this peek into my note taking and historical coaching tips help you out this season. Remember there is no one right way to do this, but just try and document as much as possible and be as consistent as possible with just yourself or across your entire team. Thanks for watching and feel free to reach out to me with any specific questions.